So, um, these chapters uh, in Wollstonecraft are about human nature, basically. I mean, of course, they're about it in certain specific respects, but um, but they discuss it pretty broadly. Um, and so, uh, in that respect, they're kind of comparable to the first part of Leviathan, right? Like, I mean, this is where Wollstonecraft is saying, so like, remember, one of the first principles what, that she wants to go back to is that the best society would be one that's founded on human nature. Um, and so the society would, that would, in that sense, be natural rather than artificial, right? So it's natural, again, not in the sense that it's, uh, like people living under oak trees eating acorns, but in the sense that it's um, uh, in accordance with the law of nature. Um, so, um, right, so I mean, there's a difference between those two because human nature is distinguished, especially by reasoning. By, well, by reason. Um, so, um, so kind of paradoxically, the natural society for human beings is going to be one that's based on rational planning. Whereas the kind of society that, like traditional society that grows up spontaneously, where people are just doing things because that's the way we've always done it, is artificial. Um, and, you know, I mean, in a way, all of our authors, with kind of the partial exception of Rousseau, basically agree with that, right? That is, I mean, they agree that the, um, the law of nature which is the same thing as the law of reason. Um, is the basis for forming the a properly constituted society. And it forms the basis of that because we start the properly constituted society by making a voluntary compact, right? So like the way to the natural society is by a rational voluntary act. Um, so, I mean, uh, again, I think uh, Wollstonecraft, you know, although they, the, the other authors might not put it exactly the same way, Wollstonecraft basically uh, is in agreement with them about this. This, by the way, you know, like one of the um, suggested paper talk topics has to do with nature, and it says, you know, and it then it says like somewhere like caution, authors may not all mean the same thing by nature or by natural. And uh, so uh, sometimes even in the same author, nature means two different things, right? Like law of nature and state of nature. <laughs> Those are two different ways of being natural. Um, but it's this sense of natural that we want if we if we want to set up a proper society, so um, so however, um, unlike Locke and Hobbes and like Rousseau, she spends most of her time not talking about what the properly constituted society based on the law of nature would be like, but rather she spends most of her time talking about how human nature has been covered over by these artificial traits. Um, so in other words, she's mostly talking about humans whose behavior is not natural. Um, and um, that in part is what makes it harder to understand 
what she thinks human nature really is like, <laughs> what it's naturally like. Um, um, so, uh, you know, and especially because unlike Rousseau, this is a, the same thing I said last time, but I'll say it again in this context. Unlike Rousseau, she doesn't look for the natural state in the past. So like, even though this, these, um, our present society is our present state of partial civilization is artificial. And there's, so to speak, and sometimes she puts it this way, there's like a cover of artifice over nature. Um, the way to see through that cover and get back to what human nature is really like is not to look in the past. Um, in the past, the state of nature, she sometimes calls it a state of sleep, <laughs> right? Like it wasn't a state where human nature came out clearly. It was a state where nothing came out clearly. Right? People hadn't started thinking yet. Um, so instead, there's kind of, there's like two ways. And again, I mentioned both of these last time. I, maybe I said both of them and didn't stop to think about whether they fit with each other. But I mean, there's two ways of looking to find out what human nature really is. And like one is to look into the future. That's where we would find it, not in the past. Um, of course, we can't see the future, right? <laughs> but, um, but we could think what the future might be like, um, right? So in other words, like Rousseau's abstra abstraction, where he kind of takes away everything he takes to be artificial. And from that, he gets a picture of what the state of nature was like. You know, for her, it's the, if you could carry that out, you would see what human beings might become. If you could strip them of everything that is, is really a vestige of barbarism <laughs> um, and therefore artificial, you could, um, you could then start to see what human beings might become. Um, but um, the other way to find it and um, this is a kind of going back, as I said before, but is to look for first principles, right? To try to go back to first principles. Um, and I guess, um, you know, the, the thought here is that, um, so like the nature of um, causing something by design is that um, the first principle in thought is the last thing that's achieved in action. And this is something Aristotle talks about. I mean, I guess he didn't invent it, but well, I don't know. In a sense, he invented it. But anyway, uh, it's something Aristotle talked, right? Like, if I want to build a house, the first thing I think about is what the, like, my aim is. Like, what I need the house to do in the end or something like that. And then I kind of work backward to, like, what has to be done to build a house. But then when I actually build the house, it goes in the other direction. Right, so if you think of the first principles of nature as kind of the divine plan, the first principles about human nature as kind of the divine plan for human beings, I think that's why it actually makes sense to say that um, um, again, she right, remember when she when she criticizes Rousseau about this, she says that you know Rousseau like saved one divine attribute at the expense of others that like Rousseau said, well, like God made us, you know, in the best state. And then it was our fault that we left it. And to which her response is uh, like, 
as if you wouldn't have known that that would happen, so to speak, right? You know, like as if uh, if I make a house in the best state and then it collapses, that shows that it's not my fault. I made it best, right? <laughs> um, but that just means I didn't make a house very well, right? Like if I do it right, you know, it should, the best state should be at the end. So, um, yeah, so I think that's the idea here. Um, now, um, and, um, and I think she's, um, if anything more clearly than Rousseau, certainly more clearly than Hobbes, possibly more clearly than Locke, that she's sincere about this like theological dimension of what she's talking about, even though she doesn't bring it up all the time. Um, I think she's sincere about it, even though she makes it clear that, uh, that she's not, and I mean, it would make sense based on her, the influence on her uh, price and other like uni Unitarian, these people were called uh, rational dissenters, I think. It was people who, so like the old time dissenters were like um, from the Church of England were like more radical Protestants. They were like, no, we have to be more biblical and, you know, bishops aren't mentioned in the Bible and so we can't have bishops and stuff like that. But this was, uh, these, these people like Unitarian uh, rational dissenters were people who said that, um, um, They, you know, we need to find the true religion of reason, not necessarily based on the Bible or a literal interpretation of the Bible. And if things don't make sense, like they thought the Trinity doesn't make sense, well, you know, we, we get rid of that, <laughs> right? So, um, so, so, you know, so she makes it clear that, that she's not uh, attached to any, right? She, she, she discussed, she says, she discusses the story of Adam and Eve in the Bible. And she says, if an angel had co would come down from heaven and tell me that that was literally true, I still wouldn't believe it. Because it's inconsistent with, you know, uh, what I know by my reason about what a supreme being would have to do. <laughs> so um, that's the kind of, that's the kind of religiosity we're talking about. So anyway, so that's the broad, uh, outline of what's going on here. So beyond that, like I said, it's a little bit hard to tell. It, I think not impossible to tell, but it's a little bit hard to tell, you know, exactly what she thinks about human nature um, and about the, the, the best society that we're heading for in the future. Um, She's, as I said, she mostly spends her time talking about humans, you know, in the present state of partial civilization. And in fact, it's mostly a lot more specific than that. I mean, like reasonably enough, given what the book is actually about, right? So I'm kind of trying to use this book for something that's not, right? I mean, it's definitely in conversation with Rousseau and Locke and Hobbes, but it's, um, you know, not like Leviathan or um, um, or uh, the second treatise or the social contract where it's like, you know, she's sitting down to write her theory of human nature and human society. It's, you know, the book is aimed at a much um, more specific goal, especially it's to argue for the way women should be educated and the way, that is the way girls and boys should be educated. But, um, but she thinks, you know, that especially uh, the education of girls is out of whack. So, um, so she spends most of her time talking about um, 
relationship between men and women in late 18th century England. <laughs> Um, um, and it's not just, it's more specific than that, actually, because, you know, it's mostly about the relationship between men and women in a certain class. I mean, she says that when she's starting out, that she's like aiming mostly at middle women and middle circumstances or something like that. Um, but you can tell also there's there's some like telling comments here, right? Like uh, on page 130, where she's talking about why it's uh, bad for girls to in a boarding school to sleep together in the same room and wash together. And she's so I don't know if she's worried about lesbianism here or I'm not sure I understand exactly what she's worried about but anyway so she says I should be very anxious to prevent their acquiring nasty or immodest habits and as many girls have learned very nasty tricks from ignorant servants the mixing them thus indiscriminately together is very improper <laughs> right so we're talking about girls who have servants not about girls who are servants <laughs> that's <laughs> Um, and there's, you know, actually on the same page, there's another thing that comes out like that, where she says, uh, um, girls ought to be taught to wash and dress alone without any distinction of rank, right? In other words, what she's arguing against is people say, well, obviously girls need servants to help them get dressed. <laughs> so, uh, so in this class and in that that class and in that time and place um, women are expected to have two characteristics which as she points out are really contradictory um, so you know the first one is they're supposed to be um, pleasing to men. Um, right, and she, you know, Rousseau says straight out, woman, you know, woman was formed to be pleasing to man. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I think Wollstonecraft just takes it that Rousseau is just expressing something that, I mean, of course, that's France and not England and whatever, but that, that she does talk about the differences there, but um, that Rousseau is just expressing something that, uh, you know, society as a whole expects this. So, um, um, where what men want, or at least what they think they want, is basically sexual gratification, right? I mean, uh, she doesn't come, she doesn't say that in the most graphic possible terms, but it's pretty clear that's what she's talking about, right? So, so um, you know, women are supposed to be sexually pleasing to men. But on the other hand, the other thing they're supposed to be is modest. Where, um, so what sense of the word modest are we talking about here? Um, so like the title of chapter seven, modesty comprehensively considered not as a sexual virtue. By sexual, she means like, we might say gendered. Right, like not as a virtue particular to one sex or something like that. But you could also understand, I think that's what she actually means by this, but you could also understand it in a sense more like what we would mean by sexual, like a, a virtue connected with sex, <laughs> right? That, and that's, that's where the contradiction is going to come in. Um, I think this is uh, uh, the relevant definition from the OEP. Um, 
the definition starts in the OED starts of a woman, right? Like, so they're saying this, in this sense, the term modest is used to describe a woman. Of a woman, decorous in manner and conduct, not forward, impudent, or lewd, demure, hence scrupulously avoiding impropriety or vulgarity in speech or behavior. And then in parentheses, sometimes applied to men in later use. <laughs> right. So, um, so this, that's modesty as a sexual virtue, both in the sense that I said that Wollstonecraft really means sexual there and in like more like what we would mean by sexual, right? Like it's modesty is a virtue specific to women of um, being uh, not lewd, demure, scrupulously avoiding impropriety or vulgarity in speech or behavior. Um, now, of course, there's another sense of modest. I mean, there's a bunch more senses of modest, but there's another rel possibly relevant sense of modest. And this is the way the OED defines that one. I don't usually quote the dictionary a lot, but this seems to be the right time to do it. <laughs> Because I like I don't think left to myself I could probably couldn't explain very clearly what the difference between these two senses is. So here's the other definition from the OED: having a moderate or humble estimate of one's own abilities or achievements, disinclined to bring oneself into notice, becoming diffident, becomingly diffident and unassuming, not bold or forward. Right, and of course there's nothing about like of a woman or you know said in later use of men or anything like that right so this is a sense of modesty that's not a sexual virtue in either of those senses of sexual and so what Wollstonecraft says at the beginning of chapter well in the title of chapter seven um, is that she's going to be talking about that second sense of modesty and yet um, as you go on in the chapter, it's clear that um, somehow the two of them are connected in her mind. Like that, that non-sexual sense of modesty is, so to speak, the correct sense, and this is the incorrect sense or something like that. Um, um, or that you would only get this sexual sense of modesty right if it were based on that non-sexual sense. So I'm gonna come back to that, but for, the, but for the moment, I mean, you know, the thing that 18th century, uh, you know, upper middle-class women are supposed to be is modest in that sexual sense. So if so, you know, Wollstonecraft points out that if you take this seriously, it you know doesn't go together with this. <laughs> um, why doesn't it go together? Well, uh, as she says on page one twenty nine. Where indeed could modest women find husbands from whom they could not would not continually turn with disgust? Right, meaning the modest women are supposed to be like people who scrupulously avoid impropriety and whatever, but um, but this one is predicated on the idea that what men want is sexual gratification, and that women's purpose is to provide that. So like when they end up with these men, they're gonna, if they're really modest in this sense, they're gonna find them disgusting. Um, okay, so like that's the situation she's talking about. Um, you know, is this still true now? <laughs> I mean, um, not exactly for sure, right? But on the other hand, um, it's not so different from our society that we don't understand it. You know, I mean, it, 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 it applies to us. It doesn't apply straightforwardly to us, I think. Like a lot of things have happened in between, and yet we certainly still, um, 
you know, recognize a version of this like double bind type thing. Um, so, um, um, so it's about that, you know, relationship between men and women in that particular society in a way, in a society that's, that's different, but not completely different from our society. But clearly neither of them are uh, what Wollstonecraft would call natural, right? Like both that state and our state are still artificial. I think that's true. I think she would say that about us. Um, which is unfortunate in a way because we've done many of the of the boldest things that she says that you should do, <laughs> and yet the good result hasn't followed, <laughs> right? Like we have changed the you know the way children are educated, and you know um, um, we have made women into legal persons with voting rights and blah 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 blah, and yet you know we're still in a state of partial civilization. <laughs> so, um, I mean, not like I'm the first one to discover that, obviously, that we've done a lot and yet, <laughs> but still, I mean, it's, um, yeah, when you read people like this in the 18th and 19th century, sometimes it can be depressing because like I've seen, you, you, you see that, you know, um, they're so confident that if you just changed this, everything, you know, would have to change. And it turns out that, yeah, it's not that easy. In any case, um, so, I mean, uh, that, as I keep saying, I, I keep trying to, almost trying to finish the sentence that, that like, that, um, uh, is the artificial state what we what we'd really like to know is what does she think the natural state would be like? Um, like what does she think human nature is like without these artificial impediments? Um, sorry, I'm stopped by that phrase artificial impediment. Of course, that's that's like the word for that's like what a law is according to Hobbes, or you know, but. That's not what I mean. Uh, yeah, she doesn't call them impediments, actually. She calls them like, like coverings. You know, they're like, they obscure human nature. They're part of, they're the foggy atmosphere that we can't see through. Right, so what would things look like if we could pierce the foggy atmosphere? Well, you know, um, I, th I think it's hard, but I think you can put some things together I mean, first of all, everything is somehow connected to those th three things that she mentioned at the beginning of chapter one. And they do keep coming back. I mean, she never like cites those first principles and um, you know, like unlike Hobbes, she's not gonna say, um, uh, but that as I proved is blah, blah, blah you know, because of the first principle or something like that, right? So, and yet you can tell that the first principles are working because these three things keep coming up in different combinations. Um, these are the, uh, like, human, human nature and therefore the law of nature. So, I mean, this is why the law of nature is the law of reason, because human nature is reason. Um, so how are these things related? Um, so like one thing is that true virtue must be based on knowledge. I mean, that obviously is an important uh, point in the like in the um, narrower purpose of the book to like to focus on education. Right? The, like if you want to know how to educate people and you want them to turn out virtuous, then she says true virtue must be based on knowledge. Um, 
This is on page 137. Weak minds are always fond of resting in the ceremonials of duty, but morality offers much simpler motives. And it were to be wished that superficial moralists had said less respecting behavior and outward observances. For unless virtue of any kind be built on knowledge, it will only produce a kind of insipid decency. Um, right, so the superficial The superficial moralists are the ones who um, think that you can inspire people to be virtuous by talking about what is virtuous behavior. Um, but a non-superficial moralist would know that you can only make them virtuous by teaching them some knowledge. says the same thing, and I won't quote that. There's another place where she says, virtue to deserve the name must be founded on knowledge. Um, and, you know, moreover, this connection with knowledge and therefore with truth is what makes true virtue natural. So this is on page 87. If any class of mankind be so created that it must necessarily be educated by rules not strictly deducible from truth, virtue is an affair of convention. So convention is the opposite of nature. In this context, I think. The idea is that um, if that because, well, so I mean, so she's saying if virtue is um, um, if virtue has to be implanted by teaching people rules that are not deducible from truth, then uh, it must be merely a matter of convention, which is to say that it's like virtuous because we agree to call it virtuous or something like that. Um, so it's, again, it's artificial. Whereas if virtue is deducible from truth, then it's not conventional, but natural. Um, I mean, uh, you're supposed to think, and of course, virtue is natural, <laughs> right? Or, I mean, let's say that. This is, you know, I mean, this is an ancient, ancient dispute in philosophy, right? Whether virtue is, um, is, natural or conventional, um, natural or positive. Uh, so, um, you need, I guess, those first principles <laughs> to, um, to see what the answer to that has to be. Right, because that is what's natural to human beings is reason, and um, the eminence of any being is its virtue. So the uh, virtue of human beings must be a rational virtue. Um, it's not that different from the way Aristotle argues in the same point. So, um, okay, so, so, Virtue depends on knowledge, or virtue worthy of the name depends on knowledge. But knowledge of what, I guess, is the question, right? Like, what is this knowledge that you're going to be taught that's going to make you virtuous? Um, so, 
I think the answer is knowledge of human nature, <laughs> right? I mean, that kind of uh, like um, sounds like there's a little bit of a circle there. Maybe there is, there's, a, there's kind of a paradox like this in the Mino, but she's not pressing in that direction anyway. So like the knowledge that true virtue comes from is knowledge about human nature. And, or that is in, at least in one sense of the term, self-knowledge, right? So it's um, philosophy basically, if you think philosophy is self-knowledge. Um, uh, and if you think self-knowledge means knowledge about human nature, right? Like that, that term is ambiguous. There's a lot of things you could mean by self-knowledge. You could think it means that I have to know myself as an individual. You think, could think it means that I have to know the nature of knowledge. <laughs> um, but, um, but in the sense, if you think of self-knowledge, meaning we have to know what we're like, what kind of beings we are, then um, I think that's the kind of knowledge she's talking about. Um, the same kind of knowledge, remember that Hobbes claimed that he, like, you know, as a, um, claimed that he had a special confidence in, right? That he knew, that um, he, he had reflected and understood the causes of, in human nature. And that's why he was able to give us the correct political system. So, um, so um, Wollstonecraft is um, basically, I think, agreeing that it's that kind of knowledge that will produce true virtue. Well, agreeing, I mean, you have to take you have to take seriously some things that I suggested about Hobbes before to see that that's an agreement, right? That like for example, Hobbes thinks that of the people who um, mostly seek wealth or mostly seek power or mostly seek sensual pleasure or mostly seek knowledge, that the last ones, although they're rare, are doing the right thing. <laughs> um, so that. From that point of view, like Hobbes would, I think would, you could see Wollstonecraft and Hobbes agreeing that um, it's this kind of knowledge about human nature that actually makes you virtuous. So um, notice that uh, it's not exactly a coincidence that this type of knowledge, unlike geometry, tends to get distorted by quote unquote interests, right? The knowledge about human nature um, is uh, um, the kind that's most closely connected with all our interests, as opposed to knowledge of how the angles of a triangle add up to whatever, right? Um, that's knowledge that's not about us, but about triangles. Um, or I think you should say, like, it, it tends to get distorted by apparent interest. Um, I think, you know, as Hobbes agrees, the people who don't have this knowledge, what they're ignorant about ultimately is precisely what is truly in their interest. Right? Like they don't know what they really want because they don't know what kind of beings human beings really are. So they don't know what kind of beings they really are. So they don't know what's appropriate for them. So um, they don't know what's really in their interest. Um, they're, you know, but that's exactly why the knowledge tends to cross what they think their interest is. So, you know, they think they want X. If they were to learn this knowledge, they would realize they don't really want X. So, the, um, so when, they, when this information is like provided to them, they react against it because they say that, you know, this will, uh, if I were to believe this, I wouldn't be able to get X. 
where X is wealth, power, and sensual pleasure. Um, um, so for example, um, when I remember when I introduced this and I said, you know, to be pleasing to men and what men want, or at least what they think they want is sexual gratification, right? So they're, they're wrong about that, according to Wollstonecraft. But this is on page 123. They're wrong about that. I mean, she thinks, uh, she thinks they're wrong about that. Uh, first of all, like for the reason Locke or Locke of the essay might say they're wrong about that. They're wrong about that in the, in the long term because the long term we're immortal beings and, you know, like the, uh, all the affairs of this life are not as important as the afterlife or something like that. Again, perhaps, in, she perhaps doesn't mean that exactly literally, but something along those lines. So, but as she keeps repeating, um, even if you just limit yourself to the affairs of this world, it's still true that it's not what they really want. So um, this is in chapter five on page 123, um, um, when a man of abilities is first, so she's talking about uh, a rake of abilities, a rake, a rake is a kind of like um, uh, polished, stylish, like seductive, uh, immoral guy. <laughs> um, uh, again, I think, I don't remember if it's OED or a different dictionary where I looked this up that uh, it said, usually said of men. <laughs> right. So, um, so a rake of ability means that like, I guess they, this rake is actually pretty smart. Um, but rather than spend his time doing something smart, he spends his time trying to make sexual conquests as he thinks of it. So when a man of abilities is, uh, maybe I should start one sentence further back, or supposing the rake reformed, he cannot quickly get rid of old habits. When a man of abilities is first carried away by his passions, it is necessary that sentiment and taste varnish the enormities of vice and give a zest to brutal indulgences. But when the gloss of novelty is worn off and pleasure palls upon the sense, lasciviousness becomes barefaced and enjoyment only the desperate effort of weakness flying from reflection as from a legion of devils. O oh, virtue, thou art not an empty name. All that life can give, thou givest. Right, so what she means by this is that this rake, like, um, um, if when the rake gets older, he, well, no, I guess I'll just put it this way. As the, the rake at first really enjoys the life of being a rake. Um, but after a while, the pleasure starts to wear off. And, um, um, and it becomes increasingly, I'm not sure exactly how these two things go together. It becomes barefaced. That is, it's no longer, garn it's no longer uh, um, varnished by sentiment and taste. And um, the only enjoyment he's still deriving from it is that it helps to distract him from based like the emptiness of his life, <laughs> right? He's fleeing from reflection as from a legion of devils. Um, I mean, I think it's something you could say and a lot of philosophers have said about a lot of kinds of sensual pleasure, not necessarily just this one that, you know, like at first it's very attractive, but, um, but uh, 
in the long term, it doesn't make you happy. And then why do you keep doing it? Because you can't bear to like turn around and see what state you're really in. Um, so, um, right. So, I mean, that's a case of, of people, an important case. I mean, again, like, it's somewhat specific to the society she's writing in. I don't know if you would necessarily describe anyone now as a rake. Um, I mean, I guess we can think of characters that are kind of similar to it, but not exactly the same thing. But like, um, uh, but uh, it's, um, it's a very important case of someone uh, not wanting to know what will really make them happy because it crosses what they take to be their interest. So they're running away from the knowledge. Um, and it's a very important case. Why? Well, you know, um, these relationships are going to determine like how children are brought up and all kinds of things. Right? So they, you know, unlike if you say, well, you know, like it's at first someone loves gobbling down Oreo cookies because of the pleasure. And then after a while, you get kind of sick of Oreo cookies, but they keep eating them because, they, you know, I mean, like that would be like, okay, that kind of sucks for them, but whatever, right? <laughs> but here we're talking about really central aspects of society. Um, so, um, so, and I think this helps to explain, first of all, um, what in Wollstonecraft's mind is the connection between those two different senses of modest that I was discussing before, right? So like modest in the sexual sense versus modest in the non-sexual sense. And again, I mean non-sexual both in the sense that it's not supposed to be specific to, it's not taken to be specific to one gender or, or another. Um, it's uh, like a universal virtue, but also that it doesn't have anything in particular to do with like not letting people see your legs or whatever, right? It's, um, it doesn't have anything in particular to do with, with sexuality. Um, so I read how the OED defines that. Here is how Wollstonecraft defines it on page 124. Um, modesty in the latter signification of the, of the term. Um, right, so, I mean, she starts by saying that she's gonna define two different terms, senses of modesty. They're actually, they're not exactly the same as the two senses I'm talking about. Although, well, I'll, let me read what she says at starting at the beginning. In defining modesty, it appears to me equally proper to discriminate that purity of mind, which is the effect of chastity, from a simplicity of character that leads us to form a just opinion of ourselves, equally distant from vanity or presumption though by no means incompatible with the lofty consciousness of our own dignity. So the first one is um, that purity of mind, which is the effect of chastity, is somehow connected to this one, or at least it's clearer how it, you might think it's connected to this one, although it's no longer sexual in the sense that it seems to pertain particularly to women as opposed to men. Um, but the second sense is 
that non-sexual sense I was talking about before. Um, right, a simplicity of character that leads us to form a just opinion of ourselves, equally distant from vanity or presumption, though by no means incompatible with the lofty consciousness of our own dignity. Modesty in the latter signification of the term is that soberness of mind which teaches a man not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. So, um, I think these are, they're, they're connected because, I mean, I'm not to claim that this is the etymological connection between them. Um, but, um, uh, they're properly called the same name, according to Wollstonecraft, because, um, the problem with immodesty in the sexual sense, um, the real problem with it is that it reflects a defect in self-knowledge about what we really want. Um, and now we can see that, first of all, that, that, that this defect in, this, in our society or in her society is uh, like especially centered on men. <laughs> um, they're the ones who, uh, um, have a higher opinion of themselves than they ought. <laughs> um, and they have a higher opinion of themselves than they ought because they don't realize what they should really want. So they want something else and they congratulate themselves for getting what they want. But, uh, but they really should be uh, embarrassed for getting something that they shouldn't want. So, um, so like that's this kind of immodest, that's immodesty in this sense um, leads to immodesty in this sense in later usage, sometimes used of men. And she, and that's exactly what she does. She, you know, sometimes says something like, there cannot be modest women without modest men. <laughs> right. So, um, it leads to immodesty in this sense in men. Um, and then, you know, uh, via this doctrine here, it automatically creates immodesty in that sense in women. Um, and so, like, the problem with it isn't that. Uh, What isn't it? I want to say that it isn't. The problem with it, with it isn't that it's like, uh, I don't know, dirty somehow, right? I mean, she does talk about cleanliness a lot. <laughs> And, but I think she talk, and she thinks that's a very important virtue. But I, but I, I don't think. I don't know. Maybe that might be the right way to put it. But the but the point is like what is wrong with it is that it involves self deception about what human beings are really like and what we ought to want. Um, and what would really make us happy. Um, and um, what's worse, it uh, it's a defect in self knowledge that um, is going to affect everyone else. I mean, that is, it's a defect in self knowledge in men that's going to affect women. So that, you know, um, is like the key difference between, you know, if I write these, these four things that Hobbes mentioned as things that people want, well, 
power sensual pleasure and knowledge. And then if I add of human nature, Professor. Yeah. Um, so when when he's uh, making these uh, these here, uh, this list or whatever, he's not uh, including women in that category. Boss? Yeah, the human nature, or whatever. Oh, well, this is not what women want, right? This is just what men want. Right? According to Hobbes. When you say well, human remember. Nature. Well, well, I mean, remember, it was a little bit ambiguous in Hobbes. And uh, that was when I first talked about the ambiguity of the English word man and how like in Latin, sometimes Hobbes is forced out of hiding because he has to decide whether to say homo or here, right? <laughs> um, but, uh, but in English, it's kind of ambiguous. Um, but uh, it seems, no, it seems like for the most part, uh, he thinks that, because uh, like remember his discussion of the family and the state of nature. So like it's it's clear that women are included in the in the thing about even the weakest is strong enough to, to kill the strongest. And that means that yeah, when he's talking about human nature, for the most part, he's talking about men and women. Because it seems like she's subordinating women to like kind of a patriarchal structure? Well, she's not, I mean, she's not doing it. She's talking about how they are subjected to it, but they shouldn't be, right? But yeah. Um, but it seems like, like she's addressing what they want and not really what women want or whatever. So like that's, well, okay. I mean, it maybe actually, maybe if I finish my thought, it will it will help, and then I'll, I'll come back and try it. Because what I was going to say about this is, like, the difference between these, which is what Hobbes says most people want these, and this, which is what he says that rare people like himself <laughs> want, is. And I said this before when I when I talked about this passage in Hobbes, that all of these things are things that uh, like for me, I want to have them and other people not to have them. Without that, they're no good. I mean, sensual pleasure less than the others, but there's, there's like competition at least for this, right? For the, but, but wealth and power for sure, like, you know, I can't have power unless other people have less power than me. <laughs> That's what I want, right? And wealth too, right? Like, you know, um, if everyone were rich, no one would be rich. <laughs> hey, you, when you want wealth, what you want is was more wealth than other people have, <laughs> right? But in this case of knowledge, um, at least if you understand properly what knowledge is and how you get it, then. Um, it doesn't make sense to want, first of all, it's certainly not necessary, right? Like, it's not like I know less if you know, if you also know, right? There's like an infinite supply of it, right? There's no competition for it. But beyond that, also, like, the more other people know, the more I can learn. This is, you know, like Socrates, again, it's like the first person to make this point. <laughs> so, um, um, so uh, when you understand, or if you understand that this is what we should really want, then you understand that inequality and injustice are actually bad for both parties. Um, um, so I think, you know, like Hobbes doesn't go on in that direction at all. I think, you know, I mean, he, I think, I think he hints at 
the fact that if everyone were like these rare people, we could build a society on a very different lines than what he's thinking about. We could and, and would want to build a society on very different lines than what he's thinking about. But since, unfortunately, since what everyone wants is these, the state of nature is a state of war, and we have to do all these things to get out of it. Right? If, ever, if what everyone wanted was knowledge, the state of nature wouldn't be a state of war. So, um, at least that's what Hobbes thinks. I'm not sure if Nietzsche necessarily would agree with me, for example. But anyway, that's what Hobbes thinks. Yeah. But that, 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 that's not the same sense of nature that she means, right? Because that, what is it the same? Oh, state of nature. Yeah, no, right? Remember, state of nature versus law of nature, right? Like, so state of nature is like, you know, before civilization or outside of civilization or something like that. Law of nature means the law that's based on human nature. So, and again, Hobbes and Wollstonecraft agree that the law of nature doesn't come into effect unless we rationally and voluntarily set things up for it. So the, so the law of nature has no effect in the state of nature, according to Hobbes. Um, yeah. So um, does Hobbes or Wollstonecraft think that like, knowledge of human nature would like produce the negation of these things because that you mean that it would make us like, poor and weak and like and when, unhappy when, well, like when we <laughs> recognize that what we want is human to understand human nature and if human nature is reason and reason produces all these other things then wouldn't that just like i don't see how what benefit because we're already using human nature, which is reason, but then the awareness of that reason wouldn't wouldn't we just continue to use reason to create the things that? Well, that's why maybe you're getting at what I was saying. Like, there's a little, there's a kind of weird circle in here. Yeah. Like, what's the actual content of it? Um, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I, maybe I shouldn't add of human nature. I mean, what we desire is knowledge, but. Um, or maybe I should. That's <laughs> I don't. The point is, uh, wouldn't we already have it? So, I mean, you know, this is what makes. Socrates say something like, well, we're just remembering it. We do already have it. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, you know, uh, knowing something means being able to remember it. <laughs> we want to, uh, we want to have this truth present to our minds when we need it. Could it also be like reason, like if modesty has like that double meaning type thing that maybe reason could too? Because like if, um, maybe. Because if, <laughs> sure, everything has double meaning. <laughs> but I mean, maybe I should say something like this that is connected to modesty. It, like, I mean, you know, what you know when you know that human nature is um, really aimed at knowledge and especially at knowledge of itself is among other things that um, there's still a lot more to learn about that. Um, so, uh, um, you know, you're not finished. I think, again, I'm not really sure whether to write this in here or not. Um, I mean, it's definitely like this is the knowledge that will produce virtue. The, the question is,
you know, Hobbes says when he finishes with Leviathan that he's going to go back to writing about natural philosophy, which is less controversial or something like that, right? Like, I mean, he definitely has desire for knowledge in general. I think that's, that's, um, um, Yeah, I wish, well, whereas on the other hand, Socrates, except in the clouds, doesn't show any interest in natural philosophy. <laughs> so I wish Wollstonecraft said a little bit more, maybe I could figure out exactly what she thinks about that. I don't know, I feel like that's not a very good answer to a question, but I, I'm, part, I'm partly answering just by saying that I guess the best answer I, I can give is, yeah, there is something puzzling about that. And it's not just here, but it's like, you know, there's, there's something really puzzling um, in the um, Charmides, I think, if you wanna see Plato, Socrates talking about this. He's like deals with the definition of philosophy as self-knowledge and then like ask, well, knowledge of what? And it turns out, you know, like you can't <laughs> solve that problem. So, um, and yet Socrates in his life seems to think he has solved it. <laughs> uh, anyway, so again, I'm not sure exactly where Wollstonecraft comes in on that, but um, But I do, so first of all, I think this is the answer to the question, or this is like the, what I wanna say about the question, why is she talking, why is she addressing the men? Why is she saying, you don't want what you should want? Um, because like, um, again, she thinks inequality is bad for both parties. Right, so she doesn't think that um, the thing to do here is to uh, um, like beat the men, right? Like win. <laughs> so now the women will get what they want. Right? She thinks the thing to do here is to show men and women that they don't want what they think they want. And that pursuing what they think they want is bad for them both. Um, so, I mean, this is something actually, so like I said, there's hints about this in Hobbes, but, uh, but Hobbes doesn't make a big theme of it. I think, the person who does make a big theme of this is Rousseau. Like, for example, remember what Fabricius said, among other things, when Rousseau imagined the shade of Fabricius speaking to the imperial Romans, he says, drive out these slaves who subjugate you and whose fatal arts corrupt you. Right, so like Fabricius is saying now, I mean, they had slaves during the Republic too, but Maybe they had, I guess they had fewer, especially back in Fabricius' day. Do you have something to say about that? No, okay. Um, so, um, so anyway, you know, Fabricius is saying, look, you think that you're doing really well because you're lording it over all these slaves, but these slaves have subjugated you and their fatal arts have corrupted you. Um, their fatal arts have corrupted you so they've subjugated you, you know, means um, you've become dependent on them. Um, their fatal arts have corrupted you means that, you know, uh, they've distorted your self-knowledge, your knowledge of what you really want. So it's really the same type of situation as what Wollstonecraft is talking about. That Rousseau is talking about when he imagines Fabricius saying this to the Romans. And yet, uh, of course, somehow Rousseau misses um, 
the main application of that, the main application of the principle that like injustice is, is bad for both parties, which is the application to the case of education. <laughs> um, right, so in Emil, he like suddenly starts thinking that, um, um, that like, by denying one party knowledge, you can establish a better relationship between the two parties. Right, I'm, I'm taking, I mean, so we didn't really read Emil in this course, but Wollstonecraft quotes extensively from Emil, if you read that part of chapter five, right? And, um, and you know, Emil has this ideal, woman who's waiting for him, whose name is Sophia or Sophie. Um, and, uh, you know, and so when Rousseau talks about how Sophie is going to be educated, it's, you know, that's when he, he, all these things come out about how women's purpose is to please men and, uh, you know, the man should be the reason, should, you know, supply the reason for the woman and so on and so forth. Um, so Wollstonecraft, you know, in effect is saying to Rousseau, like, look, you of all people should have noticed this, but somehow you don't, that this is going to be bad for Emil. I mean, the truth is, you could say something similar about the education of Emil himself, like a lot of the education involves like lying to him, basically, or tricking him. There's, you know, like, uh, Rousseau imagines having like an understanding with all the people who live around them. And like whenever Emil meets anyone, they're playing a part. <laughs> and like all these incidents are arranged to agitate them. So, um, uh, you know, you might ask, is Emil going to be able to educate his son this way? Are you are you gonna you would have to tell him? Oh, by the way, all those things that have that you think formed your character that were like fake. <laughs> so like it seems like maybe Rousseau hasn't thought that through in the case of Emile either. That that you know, by denying him truth or like screening off reality from him, you know, you can superficially produce a virtuous person but you're not producing, it's not the kind of virtue that knows how to teach virtue. That's the true kind. Um, so, um, Yeah, and so I said education is the key, and I think it's it's for Wollstonecraft, it's the key, you know, and maybe this partly helps to explain why Rousseau can't think about it right, according to her. Um, it's the key because the natural state for human beings, so to speak, doesn't come naturally, right? That's what I've just been saying this whole time. Um, I mean, it does come naturally, in the sense that our nature is reason. But reason is like activity, um, deliberation, uh, strength, uh, that is like um, control. Whereas the passive processes of like habit formation and belief formation, the what we're the things that we're going to do or believe if we don't like worry about it really, if we don't plan it out, um, are all against nature. So. Um, I don't know, to think about Emil, I mean, Rousseau is arguing that to educate someone properly and requires this tremendous like plan to the point of like a conspiracy. <laughs> um, um, 
I'm not sure I put my finger on where the difference is. This is something, you know, like uh, in the writing assignments where, you know, I, I the, the final paper assignment, I talk about comparing people and like figuring out the, what do they really agree or disagree about. It's really hard. <laughs> you know, the more you think about two philosophers, the harder it can become to explain exactly what it is they disagree about. Um, at first, it may seem easy, but then when you, you say, well, well, but well, in a way, Rousseau also thinks that. So why is it different? Right. So anyway, um, be that as it may, um, uh, let me let me read what Wollstonecraft says about uh, what happens. See, I want to say what happens naturally, but again, like natural has these two senses that are like diametrically opposed to each other. Like in one, like when we say it happens naturally, we mean, we mean like it happens if you don't do anything about it, right? Like it's the path of least resistance. And her point is that that's unnatural for human beings. So if we do that, we will get an unnatural result because our nature is reason, right? So, um, um, So ductile is the understanding and yet so stubborn that the associations would depend. So here I think she's using understanding to mean something different from reason, which is interesting. I mean, I guess a lot of people do in different ways. But this sounds a little bit Kantian. Maybe it is an evident evidence of Kant's influence. So the understanding is involved in, you know, uh, like um, I guess like the concepts we use to categorize things or something like that. There's reason is trying to like justify them and get them right. I think that's what's going on here. Anyway, so ductile is the understanding and yet so stubborn that the associations which depend on adventitious circumstances during the period that the body takes to arrive at maturity can seldom be disentangled by reason. One idea calls up another, its old associate and memory faithful to the first impressions um, particularly when the intellectual powers are not employed to cool our sensations, retraces them with mechanical exactness. This habitual slavery to first impressions has a more baneful effect on the female than the male character because business and other dry employments of the understanding tend to deaden the feelings and break associations that do violence to reason. But females who are made women of when they are mere children and brought back to childhood when they ought to leave the go-kart forever. The go-kart is like a walker. Like a, you know, thing that you used to help you walk. So, right, I guess not so much for an old person, but for like a child who's learning to walk. So, right, so that's leave the go-kart forever. Have not sufficient strength of mind to a face the super inductions of art that have smothered nature. So the super inductions of art that have smothered nature, super induction means like things that have been led in on top, <laughs> brought in on top, right? So the super inductions of art that have smothered nature are the things that, um, you need strength of mind, which is associated with reason to um, efface, that is to like get rid of. And what are those super inductions? Well, apparently it's these same associations of ideas that we formed in childhood. So if, we are educated in a way that just um, like leaves us to the 
um, at the mercy of our ductile understanding. Right, duct, ductile, I guess, literally means you can draw it out into wires. But, <laughs> but anyway, it means like flexible, right? Like the, uh, our, um, our understanding is uh, like so easily got to associate ideas of things that just happen to have come together um, that um, if we're not educated properly, when we grow up, our nature is smothered by this like encrustation of associated ideas. Um, and it's very difficult for reason to, to disentangle them. I guess the metaphor has changed there, but right, it's very difficult for reason to efface them, to get rid of them. Um, and she says, especially uh, for um, women, because uh, they're never given any, anything else to think about either. Right, so she's saying men in this class, in her society, um, not in all classes, right? Like not in upper classes, <laughs> but men in the class she's talking about engage in business. So they have to think about something rationally. Um, and that tends, tends to break some of those old associations. Um, uh, it's still bad that they're in that state, right? Just like I said, they also have not been educated properly. But she's just saying it has a it has a more baneful that is an even more baneful effect on the women in this society because in this class, again, not in every class, right? Like in lower classes, the women also engage in business, and she says they're better off. Well, I think we'll see later where she says that. Um, but in this middle class where the men engage in business and the women have nothing to do, um, nothing to think about, um, these associations just get stronger and stronger. Um, and um, And, so, and it's a kind of slavery. Um, and weakness, right? I think you've probably noticed how often she talks about weak minds or weak people. And, you know, like, what does she mean by that? Um, obviously, she's not talking about physical strength, although she says that, you know, that uh, um, strength of body is important and should be part of education for both men, uh, boys and girls. Um, but that's not what she's mostly talking about when she talks about strength or weakness. She's talking about, you know, the strong mind is the mind that like is able to take control and break these associations. Whereas the weak mind is the mind that's just uh, at the mercy of whatever happens to have happened to it. So it's passive. And so it's uh, a slave. Um, it's not giving the rule, it's receiving the rule from other things. This is something that, you know, that Rousseau also said, remember, right? That like uh, um, in the social contract, he says that the pre-civil state, the state of nature, as he describes it in that book, was a state of um, slavery to our, you know, um, inclinations. Again, because they're because our inclinations are not something that we did; they're something that happened to us. So. Um, Right, so the point is, education is, is it actually, did I write education here anywhere? No, so I can't point to it. But anyway, <laughs> education, or like put a circle around it, but um, education is, um, is 
deliberate education, according to Wollstonecraft, is crucial because um, um, that the only hope of um, getting rid of these super inductions and revealing true nature is to make sure that children are not just uh, like um, at the mercy of whatever events, whatever associations events uh, happen to form. And to do that requires strength and practice. Uh, it won't just happen by itself. Um, so, um, I guess there's so one question that's left over is why, why, according to her, did Rousseau miss this? Since it seems like she's using ideas that it, like Rousseau really agrees with. Um, and I'm not sure how to square the diagnosis that she gives of Rousseau here with the one that she gave in the other chapter, in chapter one. Um, because, so here we're talking about basically an aspect of the foggy atmosphere that partial civilization brings. Right, the, 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 the foggy atmosphere includes this lack of self-knowledge, which, which, which leads to a misunderstanding about what we really want. And that leads to a misunderstanding about um, um, uh, well, um, it leads to a misunderstanding of what men should want. Uh, it leads to a misunderstanding of uh, uh, what is the way that women could be that would be the best for men. Um, the conclusion being sort of that it's, um, absurdly not the, the way that would be best for them, not the way that would be best for women. <laughs> but, you know, but so they have to be taught in this way that's bad for them because it's good for men. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, um, and that in turn, I mean, she's gonna discuss this more in some of the readings coming up how bad this is, but that in turn means that uh, the children in the next generation are not educated properly. So it's like a, a central failure of self-knowledge here. And I mean, if you, and if you ask, why did it all happen? So like she doesn't say, but I think implicitly she has a better explanation. So remember like, when Hobbes tried to explain why there is a patriarchy, literally a patriarchy, right? Like he says, you know, like it's it's literally it's a kind of conspiracy. The fathers of families formed commonwealths, and so they made it the law that the fathers would be in charge, <laughs> right? So, but he doesn't have a good explanation of why that why did the fathers form commonwealths? I mean, I guess you could say, did I think of this before? You could say it's precisely because the, the, the children went with the mother in the state of nature that it was the fathers who first thought of this idea. That makes it seem a lot less innocent all of a sudden. I mean, if innocent is a word to associate with Hobbes at all, but hey, that it makes it sound a little bit more like Rousseau, right? That one day they had this tricky plan. Anyway, be as it may, Hobbes doesn't give a very good explanation of how this transition happened. I think uh, Wollstonecraft doesn't describe it in detail, but I think you can understand based on her history of 
the human race in general, that this is one of those vestiges of barbarism, right? That like the, the men were in charge to begin with because um, uh, on average, the men are physically stronger. And when everything was decided by battles, that made a big difference, <laughs> right? So, and we're, and so uh, like, and if you asked in that state, if you asked them to justify, why are you in charge? Just like if you ask the king to justify why you're in charge, the king would say, because I'm stronger. And if you don't put me in charge, I'll kill you, right? So similarly, if you ask the men, why are you in charge? They would be like, well, you know, we're stronger, <laughs> right? So, but now that we're in this state of partial civilization, it's 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 interesting. So the implication is that it's not only the people who got a voice, but the women who started to get a voice in that transition. But I think that's in that that fits together with what she says there. So like all of a sudden we need this like self-deceptive, deceptive and self-deceptive type of um, justification for this state of affairs. That's really just a vestige of barbarism. So. Um, so I think that's what she thinks has happened. And the question is why um, Rousseau missed it. And based on chapter one, you expect her to say, well, Rousseau was just disdained to breathe this foggy atmosphere, right? Like he just went off by himself and he wasn't, but that, you know, so um, that wouldn't really explain what the type of thing that Rousseau actually says about. I mean, in any case, it seems like it's the opposite of the diagnosis she gives here. This is on page 92. Um, but all Rousseau's errors in reasoning arose from sensibility. And sensibility to their charms, women are very ready to forgive. Yeah. I'm not sure about that sentence, whether she's including herself there or whether she just means like, Rousseau's audience, or for that matter, Rousseau's patronesses. <laughs> um, like, why was, why? Anyway, I don't know. So I'm not sure exactly what she means by that aside, or whether maybe it's kind of sarcastic and sensibility to their charms, women are very ready to forgive. Anyway, when he should have reasoned, he became impassioned, and reflection inflamed his imagination instead of enlightening his understanding. Even his virtues also led him farther astray. For born with a warm constitution and lively fancy, nature carried him towards the other sex with such eager fondness that he soon became lascivious. <laughs> right, well, you know, and then she goes on to say uh, that virtue made him practice self-denial. He didn't entirely practice self-denial, but I guess that's, I guess he does record that in a certain, maybe crucial period of his life. Um, um, so, uh, so it sounds like rather than, than like disdaining to breathe this foggy atmosphere, Rousseau's like warm constitution, you know, led him to become immersed in it. And that's why he couldn't pierce it. I don't know how to put those two things together. Um, okay, there's a bunch more things to say about this, but I don't I think there's only one minute left, so I won't try making now and I'll talk to you uh, next week. <laughs>